2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 says that God is the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort. The God of all comfort. No matter what you're going through today, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what the trials or the tribulations are, God is the, the master, the one that's able to deliver comfort into your life. That means help. That means hope. That means uplifting advice, counsel, wisdom to get over or through this mountain. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we believe we receive your mercies and your comfort. Lord David needed your comfort to face the foe, the enemy, to do what he did as a great warrior. We all need your comfort, and we believe we receive it right now. And Lord, as we come to your word, we believe we receive your help by your precious Holy Spirit, breathing on the word, the seed going into the, the soil of our heart. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Say that, amen. We receive it. Thank God. Breaking Enemy Lines, Part 4, Wolves. This is so important that we land this, Breaking Enemy Lines, and we're going to address the subtitle here, Wolves. Did you know life is dangerous? When you put wrong things in right places, like putting a hair blower or a toaster beside a tub, very dangerous. It's even more dangerous when you put wrong people in right places. The challenge is, how do we identify and discern wrong people? Face it, society is quite confused about identifying people. Even courts don't want to label lawbreakers as criminals anymore. Connect that with modern morality, hipster Christianity, and suddenly it's all good, baby. We're all good. Everyone is inherently good, and there's no such thing as an evil person. Just victims needing social justice and a new world order of morality. God says, that's a lie. That's a lie. This is absolutely distorted, immoral thinking, and that's why we all need this Bible literacy lesson on breaking enemy lines, wolves. I feel like I want to go, but I guess that wouldn't be a wolf. <laughs> Recognizing wolves. We all need to do this. For many, discernment is considered a liability. In fact, the idea of being tolerant and having no discernment to know good from evil has become even a virtue. You're considered a tolerant, compassionate world citizen if you allow a deviant with pedophile charges dressed outrageously to educate your children. Turning off all discernment is considered virtuous. The Bible speaks to cultures in the Old Testament, warning them against offering their children in a sacrificial fire to pagan deities and false gods like Baal and Molech. We're in a modern green day when turning off your discernment to throw your kids in the fires of demonic confusion and dysphoria is approved and even applauded. But know this, God says it's an abomination. Proverbs 11:20 says this, it's extremely disgusting and shamefully vile in God's eyes. In fact, a few verses later, we're told that an attractive person without discernment is a spiritual pig. What? The Bible says that? Yes. And furthermore, wolves eat pigs. So being without discretion is not only ugly, it's downright dangerous to your health to behave like bacon, spiritual bacon. Don't do it. Proverbs 12 verse 1 says this, he who hates reproof is like a brute beast, stupid and indiscriminating. In the Gospels, Jesus talks about different types of people. Beside the lost and the found, the sinner and the saved, Jesus addressed the spiritual categories of people who are hogs, dogs, vipers, and, you guessed it, wolves. Hungry, hunting, biting, devouring wolves. As I said, the trend to shy away from discernment is to buy the socialist lie that all are inherently good. Romans 3 says all are not good, but inherently sinners. That's true about me. Without Jesus in my life, there's absolutely nothing good or righteous in me at all. I don't even like me without Jesus, no. But praise God, his love makes a way of repentance for us all. That's the good news. There is bad news, but the good news is far better and far greater. So let's start off with a quote from Jesus on this crucial subject of wolves. Matthew 7, 15. 
Beware of false prophets who come to you dressed as sheep, but inside they are devouring wolves. That's right. There are devils and people who wear 100% wool suits, but they are devouring wolves. So before we get into this, let's do a quick review of parts one through three. Parts one through three of breaking enemy lines. Take advantage of the previous materials and stream parts one, two, and three over a coffee or a tea with friends and family. From the onset of this series, we determined to, number one, expose, number two, reveal, and number three, advance. Number one, expose the enemy strategies marshaled against you. Identifying a wolf is part of that. Number two, reveal the territory that God says is yours. You've got to know what's yours in Christ Jesus. And number three, advance. Advance your life line upon legal line. Guess what? Wolves want your territory. They want your land. They want to possess what belongs to you. God has willed to you an inheritance of lines and boundaries of property to possess. Look at Psalm 16, verse 6 again. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good heritage. That's yours. In Christ Jesus, that's yours. Breaking enemy lines is where you break through the opponent's fraudulent deeds and accusations. This advancement is breaking enemy lines. From the beginning of this series, I said this is spiritual warfare. It's spiritual warfare, but even more, it's about possessing God's kingdom. The pleasant places in Christ Jesus, you have supernatural power to break through all unbelief, generational curses, fear, bad habits, addictions. That's called breaking enemy lines. So buckle up for this one, people of God, because he wants, God wants to empower us to deal with wolves, sheep, eating, devouring wolves. Oh, Stephen, please now, don't go all big bad wolf on us, right? <laughs> oh, don't you fret. We're going to stay in God's word. And with the Holy Spirit's help, this will be encouraging life to each one of us. Keep in mind a scripture that I shared with you at the very beginning of this series, Ephesians 6, verse 12. For we are not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the despotisms, against the powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spirit forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural sphere. This is important to remember. Our enemy is the devil and he uses human surrogates, puppets, who give themselves over to demonic shapeshifters. In fact, Romans 1 says there's a point of decision when a human surrogate of the devil makes a choice to completely hate God and applaud others who practice the enemy's evil agenda. Here's what, here's what happens in this case. Romans 1, verse 26. God gave them over and abandoned them. Let me say that again. God gave them over and abandoned them. Abandoned them to what? Their evil choices. Cain murdered his brother because he refused God's influence, God's love, God's correction. I think people like Mao, Saddam Hussein, and Hitler, they were fully such puppets of Satan's evil. Listen to this story. Peggy Jones was mowing her back lawn in the early evening to avoid the Texas summer heat when out of the sky, a snake fell on her and wrapped itself tightly around her right arm. Then a second later, a large hawk started dive bombing her, trying to retrieve the snake. The brown and white hawk was hitting her face, clawing her arm, and all the while the snake was squeezing tighter and tighter while spitting liquids that Peggy suspected to be venom. She kept saying, help me, Jesus. Oh, help me, Jesus. Finally, the hawk broke the snake's grip on her arm and flew off with his prize. At the emergency room, they treated Peggy with antibiotics. The doctors figured that the puncture wounds on her arm were from the talons of the hawk and not the snake bites. Her arm healed quickly, but she says that she still has nightmares. She's trying to cope with the psychological toll of the experience. Peggy still can't bring herself to mow the lawn anymore. Well, is it any wonder? Sometimes it seems like that's how the enemy goes at us. He attacks suddenly without warning, and we're like, help me, Jesus! 
That's our prayer and so it should be. But remember who you are. You're not a helpless, vulnerable goat staked out in wolf territory. No, you're a child of Almighty God with mountain-shaking power and authority in Jesus' name. Devils actually tremble in God's presence and they tremble when you walk into the room with Christ in you. The predators of the underworld are beneath your feet. In Luke 10, Jesus said this. He said, you shall tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. That's the wolves. And nothing shall hurt you by any means. Enemies attack, but you're victorious. Keep that in mind. You're victorious even before the attack. You're victorious because of who you are and whose you are. We have God's weapons of warfare, and we need to activate them. We need to aim them and work them. He empowers us to break enemy lines, to possess the promised land. We get to do this. You have this in your power. Discernment is a big part of working your weapons of warfare. Otherwise, prayer has no aim. So let's understand the biblical definition of an enemy called wolf. God's word refers to us as sheep his ecclesia, Christ's body of believers. Jesus is the good shepherd caring for his sheep. Scripture refers to the enemy of God's sheep as wolves. Jesus called them wolves in sheep clothing because of their deceit, cruelty, and desire to devour. Remember, all of us were once lost sinners in need of saving, but that's not the predator Jesus is speaking of here. Humanistic morality believes everyone is basically good, so the reality of a wolf among us is the discernment the cult of the new world order just can't afford or stand. The Bible labels certain individuals as wolves in the sheep pasture. In this tolerance-confused culture, there's this benign belief humanity is generally moral, just needing a little understanding. We try to skip over our anomalies like serial killers, pathological dictators, and cult leaders. But in general, we like to think us humans, we're, we're pretty good. Not bad, but just pretty good. Let's avoid subjects like child sex trafficking and murderous organ harvesting. Like Detective Frank Drebin of the comedy movie once said, nothing to see here, nothing to see here. Meanwhile, the neighborhood is exploding and burning down with people screaming in the background. Dr. Henry Cloud, leadership coach to the CEOs and author of Necessary Endings said this, evil people are not reasonable. They seek to destroy, so protect yourself. The truth is, there are very evil, dangerous people in the world. The Bible calls them wolves, predators. They don't even sleep well until they've hurt, stolen, devoured. Look at this, Proverbs 4, starting at verse 14. Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, do not go on it, turn from it and pass on for they cannot sleep unless they have caused trouble or vexation. Their sleep is taken away unless they have caused someone to fall, for they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. Doing harm is their food, their sustenance. They love to hurt others and cause suffering. There were two teenage guys recently caught on video after they had filmed themselves laughing as they used their car to run over a man biking down the road. He was a retired policeman who had served others. These guys drove off laughing, knowing they fatally injured somebody. Listen to Proverbs 29, verse 10. The bloodthirsty hate the blameless man, but the upright care for and seek to save his life. Does God love those guys, the guys that did this terrible deed? Believe it or not, yes, he does. Will God forgive them? Yes, if they ask. Can they be delivered of being wolf class and become lambs? If they take advantage of Jesus' death at the cross, cease to be what they were and be reborn in Christ Jesus, all things are possible. Should they go free of all consequences for their actions? Consider this, Jesus forgave the thief on the cross beside him and welcomed the man into his kingdom, but the Lord did not deliver the thief from earthly consequences of his criminal choices. If you choose to jump in front of a bus, the Lord will forgive you, but you'll have a nasty dent in your head. Don't confuse forgiveness with restoration. 
Those are two different miracles. Recently, the news reported that a young man, 21, attacked an elderly woman in her 70s getting off of a bus and he stomped on her head. She had boot prints all over her face. When the police arrested him, he said that the woman said something that he didn't like. What do you think Jesus calls that? I mean the real Jesus who braided a whip to go after the merchants running a con on the people in the temple court. Some believers' version of Jesus would say, just forgive the poor little fella. He didn't get enough love growing up. Stomping on the weak is his way of asking for help, asking for love. Yes, God says forgive, but no to calling the wicked innocent for any reason. Just look at the harvest you get when you sow that kind of corrupt seed. Proverbs 24, verse 24. He who says to the wicked, you are righteous and innocent. Peoples will curse him. Nations will defy and abhor him. So why is this so important to you and me? If you cannot discern between God's family and God's enemy, Houston, we got a major problem. If you can't tell a lamb from a wolf, you'll sit with a predator, do business with a predator, maybe date a wolf or even worse, get married to one. They're not pets and you can't train them for good. Jesus especially warned against leaders who are wolves disguised as sheep. Look at this conclusion as the Apostle Paul warns against these very dangerous types of people. Titus 1 verse 16. He said, they profess to know God, to recognize, perceive, and be acquainted with God, but deny and disown and renounce God by what they do. They are detestable and loathsome, unbelieving and disobedient and disloyal and rebellious, and they are unfit and worthless for good work, deed, or enterprise of any kind. The apostle says they profess to know God. And he says they're detestable, loathsome, unbelieving, disobedient, disloyal, rebellious, unfit, worthless for any kind of good work. Remember, this is New Testament and not the rugged Old Testament. The truth is the New Testament actually dials the discernment up even to another level. You're called to discern good from evil. The Bible is a book of discernment. You're called to do this. This is an assignment. There have been times in my life when I've been foolish. I've chose to be a fool instead of listening to wisdom. But God graciously reproved me and helped me repent. Like the prodigal, I turned to God, the Father, and He forgave me. We heard in Romans 1 that there are people who will never repent because they love doing evil. They get pleasure from hurting, stealing, deceiving, and causing others to suffer and die. In Luke 13, verse 32, Jesus called King Herod the political leader of the day. He called him a fox. Jewish people understood the fox was an unclean animal. Herod ordered the execution of many, many Jewish baby boys around the time of Christ's birth. Jesus forgives sinners, heals the sick, defends the accused. He gives mercy to the condemned. But wolves and foxes, predators, Jesus pulls out the shepherd's rod and evicts them from the pasture. You mean Jesus doesn't snuggle wolves? <laughs> The good shepherd is an enemy to the wolf because he cares for the lamb. He cares for you. That's right. Shepherds are pro-life and anti-wolf. Imagine that. Read Psalm 23. A true shepherd actually protects sheep from wolves. Imagine that. In what crazy world would a shepherd allow wolves to get close to lambs? where sheep are told to hang out with wolves because God so loved the world and it's part of your suffering. That's unbiblical. And yes, you can say it. That's just downright crazy. In Matthew 7, verse 15, Jesus warned about false prophets who dress as sheep, but inside they are devouring wolves. In Acts 20, verse 29, Paul the apostle said, after I'm gone, ferocious wolves will get in among you, not sparing the flock. Jesus never told Peter to feed my wolves. Hey, if you love me, feed my wolves. The enemy works a strategy to advance his deadly line against God's children. We have an impenetrable shield if we use it. The good shepherd defends us if we call on him for help. 
Refusing to believe there are predators doesn't mean that they don't exist. Calling predators educators, for example, does not protect your children, your family. That's willful ignorance. As the Louisiana Senator John Kennedy said, more sheep doesn't solve the wolf problem. I don't know if I got the accent right there, but he was, of course, referring to sacrificing the innocent, the vulnerable population, to tyrants. God wants to protect you from the devourer, but we have to use his love accurately. Remember, 1 John 4, 18 says, perfect love evicts all fear. Some people are agents of terror. These people should be disqualified from access to your home, even if it's through your screen and your entertainment devices. Proverbs 14, verse 16, a wise man suspects danger and cautiously avoids evil. Discernment helps you avoid evil. At the end of World War II, the Allies began to liberate prisoners in the concentration camps. They found those still alive in shocking, desperate conditions. Not only were they starving, malnourished, in need of medical care, but they were so mentally despondent and broken, they couldn't believe the food and medical help wasn't just another vicious attempt to murder them. Allied soldiers and doctors had to win over the trust of these horrifically emaciated victims so that they could properly care for them. Their discernment was ravished. They didn't know who to trust. Who could they believe? Discernment, it's essential to life. Hebrews 5, verse 12 and verse 14 says this. You actually need someone to teach you over again the very first principles of God's word. You have come to need milk, not solid food. See, he's talking about the truth here to these people. And then verse 14, but solid food is for those whose senses and mental faculties are trained by practice to discriminate and distinguish. That means discern between what is morally good and noble and what is evil. God's saying, grow up. You need to discern between what is good and evil. Don't put this off. Tony Bennett, the late great iconic singer, he wrote in his autobiography about his time as a soldier in World War II assigned to liberate these camps that we were talking about. He said this, we immediately got food and water to the survivors, but they had been brutalized for so long they couldn't believe that we were there to help them and not to kill them. Tony said their pain deeply impacted him for the rest of his life. A secret Nazi headquarters in Poland during World War II was named by Hitler Wolf's Lair. (laughs) Think about that. The tortured were so lost and confused that they could not discern between the wolf and an ally friend like Tony Bennett. I'm concerned about our families, our schools, our country. I know you are. Have we come full circle now? After so many years, are we no longer able to discern between the evil wolf and a true friend? One of the worst mistakes to make is not recognizing a wolf. Jesus warned of a culture that would see but wouldn't perceive. We can't revise Christianity to normalize wolf habitat in our midst or worse, in our home. Evil likes wearing 100% wool. They appear nice, well-mannered, even warm and fuzzy at times. They circle sheep looking for a way in to overpower and devour. But don't be afraid, my friend. Don't be afraid because you're not alone. You've got great help. Yes, be alert, but know this. We have the good shepherd's expert help. So let me close this chapter with this. Discerning life includes discerning wolves. You might be asking, well, why do we even bother discussing the devil's schemes if he's defeated? That's a great question. It comes down to this, lines. Lines in the realm of the spirit define kingdoms, borders, and lots. Colossians 1.13 says, God delivered us from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of his love. The realm of the spirit is all about kingdom jurisdiction, a kingdom of life or a kingdom of death. When you go to a zoo, you consider it fun, safe, family friendly, why? Because of the boundaries, the fences, the jurisdictions, you know the zoo is perfectly set up to separate you from the wild animals so you can look at the wolves and the predators without them being able to hurt you or eat you. 
The idea is to give you a safe close-up view of dangerous predators all while they remain 100% in captivity. The zoo doesn't let lions out so that you can pet the wild kingdom experience. No, that would turn a whole family-friendly experience into the family is now dinner experience. Think of this, the predators are captives in the zoo. No matter how nice those enclosures are, the animals are captive behind the lines of determined jurisdiction. It's the zoo kingdom. You're safe to look at the wolves from a place of freedom, but not freedom to disregard the lines and boundaries. You discern the danger, but never jump into the danger, right? Unless you're like those POWs and a deceiver has hacked your discernment. Friend is foe? Foe is friend? I, I don't know. Who knows? Well, the spirit of truth always knows, and you can too. Discernment. Hebrews 3 verse 13. But warn one another every day that none of you may be hardened into settled rebellion by the deceitfulness of sin, by the fraudulence, the stratagem, the trickery, which the delusive glamour of his sin may play on him. Did you get that? Trickery, delusive glamour. If you jump into the jurisdiction determined to keep the predator captive, then regardless of how free you are, you're bear food now, you're wolf food. Why? Because you're disrespecting kingdom lines and boundaries. You're stepping out of spiritual jurisdiction. You're jumping into wolf enclosure shouting, grace, grace, but that's not wisdom. That's foolishness. Use discernment and live on the right side of the glass, on the right side of the lines of authority. How do you do all this? What's the secret to spiritual warfare? Breaking enemy lines? It's truth. Jesus said in John 8, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Truth is not something you run from and neither is it convenient. Most families run from discernment about someone in their bloodline. It only puts you and your loved ones on the wrong side of the glass, the wrong side of the lines. Discernment, discernment, discernment. You must work discernment. You break enemy lines when you're under God's authority in his name, safely in the jurisdiction of identity in Christ Jesus. Remember, the seven sons of Sceva, they got bit by the wolf being without the borders of identity. Truth and truth alone gives birth to identity. Forget your blood DNA and remember Jesus' blood. When you focus on his identity, it empowers you to discern right in the light of his truth. You must know and act on the truth. That's discernment. Yes, the devil is completely defeated, captive, and under the heel of Jesus' victory, but that's not an excuse to be ignorant to his schemes, allowing him to take advantage of you. I said at the beginning of the series, wake up, wake up. It's time to discern so you can actively be breaking enemy lines. Yes, you can start this today. Let's pray. Let's pray and authorize God's overcoming power in your life, in your home. Father God, we activate the weapons of our warfare now. We put on the whole armor of God by faith. We've been transferred and delivered into the jurisdiction of your victorious kingdom. We live in this world, but we're not of it, no. We're children of light, so we seek first your kingdom. If we've tolerated evil in our homes, forgive us and revive discernment to act on your wisdom. You rebuke the devourer for our sake. Praise God. You are the good shepherd and you have zero tolerance for wolves because you love us. In Psalm 37, you laugh at the wicked and you turn their weapons against them. In Psalm 28, you promise to be our strength and our shield. We receive your protection and we choose to live in your presence. You give us power to break through enemy lines. You give us lines of inheritance, the pleasant places. Thank you, thank you for discernment to know good from evil and in Jesus' name, we have the boldness to walk in it always, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.